Four and a half minutes after 8 o'clock, KLOS Los Angeles. Good morning to those of you who are just joining us. We've been here since 5, doing open conversation. No holds barred telephone talk. It's now time for the Impact program, commercial free until 9. Impact a bit different than open conversation in that it features in-studio guests live. And uh, we will take some phone calls at the end of the show, but it's one particular topic that we focus on. And... uh, Today we have a repeat guest. Normally I maintain at least a one-year separation on guests, but my guest this morning is an exceptional individual, and we did have overwhelming response to his last appearance, and he's not often in L.A., so we've consented to have him back again. It's Vernon Howard, and Vernon, good morning, and welcome. Good morning to you, Michael. Nice to have you on the Impact Show. This is a field of uh, um, your expertise, the nature of thought and awareness and consciousness that has fascinated me, largely, I guess, as a result of doing talk shows like this. Yeah. Um, is it something that you've always been fascinated with, too? Oh, yes, ever since I was a boy, because I noticed, uh, when looking at from a boy's uh, eyes, looking at adults, that they were all scared. That's the one big impression I got of the world as a boy, looking at my own parents, looking at friends, looking at teachers, looking at everyone. They were scared. And I got to wondering, well, is this the way it has to be? It must be, because everyone is that way. Then I began to question that premise that everyone has to go around being terrified of everyone else, of economics, of the future, and so on. And I challenged that until the point that the whole, the whole sham of it vanished, was vanished. At some point, or was it gradual, you yeah. no longer were insecure? No, it came, it came very gradually, because all that junk, fear junk, terror junk, confusion junk that society imposed on us, it's pretty thick, pretty hardened. So it takes a little time, a oh, little time, it takes a long time, a lot of hard work, a lot of self-facing, a lot of ego destruction, in order to see that we were living from a false sense of identity that we took as real and that we thought was the only thing that existed. In other words, we wouldn't feel so helpless, so powerless, so so, uh, manipulated uh, and dependent if we had a more accurate understanding of who we are? Oh, yes. And to understand who we are, in one sense, is very simple. All you have to do is disbelieve everything you've ever been told about yourself. For example, that you have to be a big success, that you have to be what is called respectable, that you have to win uh, ego victories over other people. When When you see what is wrong and see it clearly, when you see that your own state is wrong and that you don't want the self-torment of that anymore, how easy and how eagerly you say, I've had it. This is as far as I'm going in playing this masquerade, this stage performance that society said was all there is. It isn't all there is, but you have to go through yourself. And pulling off the mask is very painful at times because it's stuck there pretty hard. Yeah, it sure is. And the kind of um, irresponsibility, I guess, or dependency... Uh, that, that goes along with this false identity is real tempting too because to to take off that mask and to seek a real identity really means that you can't blame other people anymore, doesn't no it? more. You have to see that you yourself, although you, you were imposed on as a child, you were misdirected as a child, now look, at a certain point, Michael, you, me, and everyone else got to be 18, 20, 25, or 30. 176 that we'll give again at the end of the program and uh, give Vernon a chance to talk more about these um, these lectures that he's given. So, so stay with us, uh, and we'll give you more details on that. Vernon, I want to ask you about something that I call the either-or mentality. It's also referred to as linear thinking, okay, or or dualism. Sure. Um, so often we set up what turn out to be false dichotomies in our attempt to reach some immature understanding of things. Uh, Even as teenagers, we feel some urgency to hang a label on ourselves. That's Uh, right. A 16-year-old is asked if he's liberal or conservative, if he's supporting the arms race or or not. And and so we're we're real anxious to hang these signs around our necks. And, And yet so often that comes out of a simplistic understanding that there are only two ways. Yes. 
How big a trap is this, and how do we uh, see it, identify it, and avoid it? That's a very, very good point to make, because when you're living from the intellect, from your mind, which you have to use for practical purposes of driving your car and so on, but when you use your mind to get a sense of identity, as we discussed earlier, then you do indeed go to the opposites. Yes and no thinking, I'm right and you're wrong thinking, things like that. Now, if you tell someone, look, sir, madam, there is another way to think that is above this dualism, above these opposites. There is another way to think. What do they do? They start thinking about it. See, <laughs> they can't understand it. They start thinking, and, and they already say, ah, all I have to do is read one more book and I will have it. See, and they've got the I in there very strong. See, truth is without the I. God, reality, truth, is without a sense of self. If I tell you, I know the truth, I know what it's all about, and, all, and I'm talking from my vanity, from one half of the dualism, the I, there's me and there's you, and if I say, I understand, I don't at all, I'm deceiving myself, and there'd be a lot of violence there. Now, just the other day, a, a man said to me, but what if we drop our sense of identity? Ah, now here's the key question. He asked, What's next? What's beyond it? Who will I be? See, people are so terrified if they drop their false identities of being right, for example, then they won't know who they are. Marvelous! Don't know who you are! Have nothing at all, because when you do that, you have transcended the mind, and you will know who you are without thinking about it. Now, are you willing to take the leap? That's the question we have to ask everyone. Are you willing to let everything go that has made you what you are, both good and bad, be nothing at all, so that you'll know who you are from a spiritual viewpoint? How do you feel about the word mystic or mystical? It's all, all right as a certain descriptive word describing a certain approach. It's fine, but like all other words, it gets twisted, and a lot of falseness gets added to it, and a lot of false practices get get added to it. Well, the reason I ask is, especially in the Western Hemisphere, we are so oriented toward the material world, materialism and consumerism, and we put our value on things that are objective, that exist, they have size, they have weight, they have value. We've, we've gone so far to that extreme that it um, seems we've reached a point, and perhaps we've been there for some time, where we even deny the existence of of the subjective or non-physical realm, let alone the notion that something valid or something true could come out of it. See, the, the intellect by itself can only see the physical. It can see new automobiles and brand new homes and going to the moon and whether you're uh, good looking or not good looking, whatever. The intellect can only see that. So the intellect can never find anything that's beyond the physical. The truly spiritual, the truly invisible world can be seen. And you can see it right now while living in this world. You can see it, and not only can you see it, but this kind of special seeing is being it. Now, the way for, if anyone listening wants to find out how to do it, just do it. Just get rid of all the junk, admit that it's there, let truth take it away, and you'll know what it means to live right in the middle of this lunatic asylum <laughs> called society, right in the middle of it, and it won't be able to touch you anyway, financially. You, you, it won't make any difference to you if, if you have five dollars or five million dollars, because that's not where your identity is. And you can walk around a free man or woman, and a very innocent man or woman who could never hurt another human being, because truth could never hurt a human being. One of the things that intrigues me most about you, Vernon, is that you really shun the, the techniques of meditation or, or of uh, biofeedback or jumping into these isolation tanks. You're saying, just do it. Oh, yeah. Look, don't we talk enough to ourselves with, <laughs> without making it a religious talk to ourselves? Look at yourself as you are. Be shocked out of your boots if necessary. Lay there on the ground, broken and wounded and crying and weeping. But stay down. If you try to get up, that's your ego getting up. Stay down and truth will pick you up. Isn't that beautiful? Really? Is it possible for me to... Yes. Come <laughs> all things. You don't even need to hear the question, right? 
Of course it is. Is it? Po- let me ask you anyway. Is it possible for me to come from from a place uh, of uh, peace and and true identity that you're talking about, and still be successful in the traditional sense? Let's say that I want to be a better broadcaster. I want to reach more people. I want to attain certain aspects of success. Maybe I don't see money and and status being my yes, final I goal. That, yes. But nevertheless that's part of it. Can I can I All right. It? All right. When the sun rises in the morning, does it brighten everything on, on earth unconditionally? Yeah. There you are. When truth rises inside of her, of course, you're going to be a far more efficient person in your business, in your family life. You're going to deal intelligently toward your children, toward your wife or husband. Why? Because wholeness expresses itself out to everything in the exterior world. The answer is a marvelous, beautiful yes. Try it. Just try it. So the only thing I'm giving up, really, is ego and this false identity. Right. The, the unconscious self-torment which people take as true life, and that's a good point, if I might go into it just Please. very briefly. People live in unseen violence, in nervousness, in hatred, in anger, in self-deception. And astonishingly, they call that life. They call it life because it gives them a vibration. They call a vibration of hatred, for example, life. And they feel, oh, I'm alive. That's not life at all. It's the exact opposite of it. But since it's all they know, they say, I better hang on to my anger. Better hang on to my accusation. Or who will I be if I let, see? It, we always come back to that. Who will I be? Find out who you'll be. And God will not let you have any bargains with him. He says, you let go first and leave it to him who you will be. Because if you don't let go first, you'll simply bring your old nature into the what you call a spiritual world, and now you become a religious hypocrite, which is pretty bad. Why is this? Why are these such difficult lessons for us to learn? So many well, masters yeah. have said the same thing yeah. over and over again. Yeah. And we always want to guarantee that we'll be able to, listen to this, that we'll be able to become new while staying old. Now figure that one out. See, we want to bring our old ideas, our own identities, calling ourselves a good religious person or whatever. We want to bring those over into the other shore. But the truth says, no, no, you leave everything behind, everything. Dare to do it, do it. And you'll see what's on the other shore, which is simply something which your intellect could never, ever see or understand when you're on that dark jungle on the other shore. Take the leap. One of the most profound aspects of this search for me, and I do feel I am still searching, I haven't arrived, I haven't been able to to get to that point, as you say, where you just do it or just are free of that. I'm still very aware of my ego, and yet I'm on a path, I feel I'm, I'm, I'm searching. But one of the things I've learned that I'd like you to comment on, and I relearn it just about every day, is that contrary to everything I'd been told, the answers to my problems don't come from other people or come from uh, situations or circumstances outside of me, and I don't learn about them through my physical senses. The real answers to my problems have come intuitively or, or in, in the form of inspiration or revelation. They are from the subjective. And that was such a revelation to me because I had been taught that this was hallucination or illusion. I'm fooling myself. Don't listen to that yeah, intuition yeah, that, yeah. that the cause of your problem is outside, so find the answer outside. The chief problem with that is when you first begin to look inside yourself to learn your nature as it is, not according to the mask you wear, the first layer consists of everything that is false, that is deceptive, that is hard, that is unpleasant. Now, but underneath that is the treasure of truth. So the average person, when you tell him, now examine yourself, sir or madam, and see, see how many lies you tell all day long, how you ramble on all day long pretending that you're talking intelligence. So and you tell them to look at that, they're not going to like it very much, are they? Because it goes contrary to their idealistic self-image of being a capable, adequate, intelligent person. Now, if you can try to get through to this person, which isn't easy, isn't easy to get through to any of us, that the treasure is underneath the trash. Hmm. 
Now, and if a person will stick with the trash in himself long enough and get aside a little bit of the trash, he'll begin to catch his first glimpse of gold, of treasure, of, of rubies, or whatever you want to call it, down inside. But that's the process that must be followed. But here's the mistake everyone makes. You tell them, look, sir, and see how hypocritical you are religiously, how you talk religion, but you're a horrible human being. When you tell them to, to look at that, they say, wait a minute. I am not that person you, you just said I was. I am a nice, religious, kindly, gentle person. See, it's here where the opposites come in that we just talked about. Wow. He has a picture of being nice, but there is the fact of his undeveloped self, ignorant self, actually there. Now, we say this. All your idealistic, phony, self-flattering self-images are the worst enemy you could ever have because they prevent you from digging into inside the trash barrel and seeing that it is nothing but hypocrisy. And if you go long enough in that, someday you'll pause and you'll say, thank heaven I never stopped digging because you found your first little piece of gold inside, the gold which has nothing to do with your own identity, own intellect, but has to true it has to do with true religion, true spirituality, in which you were you were right in the picture, but you were not the, the whole center of the picture it's yourself. Is life about growth, improvement? Absolutely. Getting better. Yeah. We're born in this world pretty ignorant, aren't we? Yeah. And can we admit it? Naked, helpless. Oh, yes. H horribly helpless. Alone. And, and all the evil people pounce on us when we were kids and teenagers and make it worse. The, the wonder is that one man or woman in a million makes it out of the mental nuthouse. <laughs> it's so bad. That's the miracle. Do we ever find our way out of the carnival here? Yeah, right. It, it can be done. And the truths that uh, we're talking about now are the exact way out. If an individual will take them, stop, stop lying. Sir, madam, stop lying, and you'll find that the truth is the only friend you've ever had. Lies are very vicious, aren't they? Is no. humbling ourselves? Oh, and yes, sure, call it that. This is a, this is a path or a way sure, to... Sure, sure. But not, not having an idea of yourself being humble. You can, you can be religious and do that. Oh, I'm, I'm overall understanding, even the understanding of how to get along down at the office better with those people. Because I, I go down there, and you know, man says, I go down there in the morning, I had a fight with someone yesterday, and I go in all nervous, and I see him over there looking nervously. I mean, now, if you see that his own in spiritual inadequacy, which was causing the whole problem, he could go beyond it, he would rock, walk right into that office, and he would never have a fight with that man again, because there'd be nothing in him that caused it. The other man could fight with him, but he would not be aroused by it. Again, given your your advice that there's really nothing to it but to do it, is there value, do you believe, in um, learning about self-hypnosis, uh, meditation, uh, experimenting with biofeedback technologies, or climbing into these isolation tanks? No. Why? No. Why? Why do you distract yourself from the first task in life, which is to see what you're like? Oh, the world has thousands of escapes. And you've named a few of them. Look. Isn't that just a more effective kind of introspection, now look, though? Now, look. Here we are, Michael, seated here now, right? Mm -hmm. Right now, as you and I are talking, why can't, and we can, why can't we both look at ourselves, you look at yourself, and I'll look at myself, and as well as look at each other, because it goes back and forth, doesn't it? Why can't I see what my state is right now? And I can. Now, why, why waste time? Why take a detour? Do it right now. Anyone listening to us right now, wherever he is, the home or car, he can sit right back and he can say to himself, what's going through me right now? What's, what, is there a negative thought? Is there confusion? Or, or, did I just say, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about, or I know what I'm talking about? What is your state without identifying with it? Which means, don't think that that is you talking because it isn't. It is a thought talking which you take as being you, which is not you at all. And when you see that, the whole, the whole masquerade, the whole fakery falls apart. And that person could sitting home right now could just suddenly become free. It doesn't work that fast. I feel, Vernon, that I get glimpses of that, but that it slips through my fingers. Yes. And the harder I try, the more elusive it becomes. Ah, uh, yes, because who is trying? 
Me. Yes. Yeah, the ego. Stop trying. <laughs> yeah, the guy that picks up the check. Yeah, right. <laughs> Let it happen. Yeah. You talk about self-observation. And, you know, words fail in this area. It's difficult for me to uh, to communicate this, but I know you're, you're, you're a step and a half ahead of me here anyway. So help me uh, describe this feeling that I get occasionally that I can observe myself or that I am observing myself or that this awareness shift that reality takes on a slightly dreamlike quality and suddenly uh, while I'm still aware of my body it's in a different kind of a way and it's almost like I'm alongside myself observing uh, myself. Yes, that is exactly what you're supposed to be doing standing apart and looking at it just like you're standing on a, a river bank and you see the boat come down and the log come down and the canoe come down or whatever you are not in that boat. You are not the boat. You're simply standing apart from it as an observer. But the problem with human nature is someone sees the boat out there and he says, I want that boat. It looks like a treasure ship of some kind. It has a pirate gold on it or something. We want, we desire, because we think we have to get an, an identity out of that. Now I'm a rich man. I've got pirate's gold. Stand apart. You are never what you see. Never. If you see it, that's thought operating. And who you really are is above thought, above idea, above labels. I read this book one time, which was not a mystical or, or metaphysical book in any way, but nevertheless uh, gave me a lot of insight into that, called Seeing Yourself See, written by a ophthalmologist who was talking about becoming more aware of the seeing process instead of identifying with that set of eyeballs and that brain that's receiving the impressions. Yeah. Because... Um, becoming in a detached, more detached fashion, aware of those impressions yes. and aware of the process of interpreting those yes. impressions, but being alongside of that instead of being so exclusively focused out into the physical world. Don't identify with your thoughts. It can be summed up as simply as that. Don't call yourself your thought or your feelings or your body or anything else. If you identify with your body, you're going to be worried over growing old, aren't you? If you don't identify with it, if you know you're not your body, which you are not, now you're already in eternity, not in time. Uh, Let me give you the telephone numbers because I'm sure there's many people who would like to join us. Uh, Mark Felsett is our producer. He'll be taking your phone calls, and after a few questions, he'll put you on hold and, and get you ready to put you on the radio here. My guest is Vernon Howard. If you have questions uh, about the areas that we've been talking about, call us by all means from Los Angeles. 870-8716, also 5205567. If you're in the San Fernando Valley, telephone number is 9815567. And uh, from Orange County or elsewhere in the 714 area code 5345567. Lines are open. Call now and we'll try and get to you before 9 o'clock. Vernon Howard is my guest 18 minutes before 9 o'clock this morning. We're talking about uh, human essence, who we are and the nature of thought and awareness. A lot of this has been described, Vernon, by uh, teachers as all various kinds of energy phenomena. Are there parallels from electricity or electromagnetism or from uh, the kind of spirit that we hear about in the, uh, the Holy Ghost and the Christian tradition and the Kundalini and odic forces and that kind of thing? What about this energy uh, analogy? Energies do overlap and intermingle. And it's a very good idea for a person who wants to change himself inwardly to begin to simply think of himself as a channel for energy instead of an originator, originator of them. It comes through us, not from <laughs> right, us. Right, comes through. And when you do that, the, all this business of energy will make, become quite clear to you. And, oh, will you be energetic in a new way. You grow more energetic as you grow older instead of less, as most people do because you're being inspired by something other than your own petty little mind. Isn't that a nice thing? Do you, do you personally, Vernon Howard, yeah. VH, ever um, reach a point where you figure, 
Well, I guess I pretty much got it figured out, and I guess revelations from here on will be relatively minor and reinforce what I already know. Or are you still on the most wondrous journey of your life? Oh, Michael, do you know that I, I'm working very hard right now as I'm talking to you? It's very easy and very hard at the same time. And what it consists of is me sitting here and looking over there. You're smiling at me now. And I'm being aware of my reaction to your smile, of the other people in the other room there. See, I'm, I'm being aware of the whole room and my reactions to that room. And if I see anything that I can e could detect in the smallest way that would be wasteful, for example, I don't want that wasted energy to passing through me. And awareness is light. Therefore, when you see it, that light dispels the darkness of wasted energy. So I've been working very hard ever since we started talking. <laughs> so have I. <laughs> <laughs> because I would much rather just sit back and listen yeah, to you speak. I know. And again, let me say, Vern is going to be doing that. That's that's one of the things that you're known for is a kind of, I don't want to call it charisma or magnetism, but there's an ambiance that... Uh, oh, and you can feel it and others will feel it. It's the spirit moving? Yes, absolutely. And, and it's they'll available, be very, isn't They'll it? be very much attracted to you and yet afraid of you. <laughs> Figure that one out. <laughs> Vernon, if you would put those headphones out, yes. we'll go to the telephones and take a few calls. 870-8716. And I have one line available at 520-5567 if you have questions for my guest, Vernon Howard. This is the Impact Program. Good morning. You're on KLOS. Hi. Hi. Uh, Mr. Howard, I'd like to ask you a question. Yes, please. You say that, um, you say that we should give up our ego. Yes. That we should totally give it up. That we should, that it happens... I think you're saying that we should do it all at once, that there's no halfway, right? No, there are stages. You could do it at once if you could do it, but you can't. Okay, well, I was wondering, what if we, what if we, have, what if we like the position we're in? What if we do have an ego and we like it? Are you telling me that you like self-torment? That you like anger? That's what the ego is? Now, you know that. Come on. Um, well, you talk a lot about... Um, let's see, introverting and yeah. speaking, well, and looking at yourself. Okay. But the ego, doesn't it relate to other people? Doesn't it relate to the people around you? Well, the ego always relates to other egos and collision and disaster results. Now, of course, you have to begin in your, wherever you are right now, to begin to detach yourself from your ego. And you can start right now because you've just heard a sentence that says you should do it. Now, you're not going to do it overnight. Society makes pretty sure of that. They make you so hardened by the time you're 20 or 30 that it becomes very hard. But nevertheless, don't you ever, ever think that it's hard to become true because truth is on your side and will do it for you. And you can't do it for yourself. What you can do is to be so completely humiliated by your defeats in life that you no longer want anything to do with it. And truth will give you something that your mind can't even think about right now. I didn't get your name. What is your first name? My name is Adam. Adam, uh, let me ask Vernon a question on your behalf and get your, your reaction to it, because I want to know more about what you've said about uh, uh, ego. I happen to... Uh, pretty much like my ego too and let me ask for both of us if it's possible for us to go through this ego death and still like what we like about ourselves oh but there will be something else liking a new identity yes. not no identity N not not your mind not your old nature but something new that you will know when you reach the other shore you can't imagine it don't you dare try to imagine it now, because now imagination <laughs> is gone. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. So if you take the leap, and let's see, you've heard phrases, trust truth and all that. That's Faith. what you have to do. Now look, the average person really believes that his life is worthwhile, going through angry and hard-faced and sarcastic. He believes that's worthwhile. And what we're trying to do is say, sir, madam, you're a very miserable person calling yourself a secure person. This security is based on time thinking. That is, you say, look, right now I'm secure because I'm, I'm angry. All right, you're not going to live forever in this world. Who are you going to be a hundred years from now? Wouldn't you like to be something that's still alive instead of lifeless as you now are? I'll tell you, this is pretty shocking stuff, but those who stick with it will come out on the other side.
I'll tell you, this is pretty shocking stuff, but those who stick with it will come out on the other side. I don't think um, most people would actually take the leap. What are the chances that we could ever get back if we didn't like it? Ah, see, who said that? <laughs> who said that? That man's name said <laughs> Adam. Yeah. Adam. Adam said it, the first man. That's right. What a coincidence. Adam, thank you for calling. All right, thank you. All right, bye-bye. 12 before 9, you're on KLOS and the Impact Show. Good morning. Hi, my name is Don. Hello, Don. I wanted to ask uh, Vernon what he thought faith is in a human. Because um, faith is something a lot of times that's just not questioned in most people, and you just follow that. And I want to know what he uh, thought of that. Faith. What you thought of hate? Faith. Yeah, what faith. Was, oh, faith. Faith. Faith, yeah. faith or faith? Faith. F-A-I-T-H, faith. Yeah. yeah. Forget it. <laughs> Let me tell you why. Not you <laughs> I'd like to offer another thought that's come to Go me ahead. out of the, everything. That Christ, when he came here, Jesus, allowed, speaking of energy, an energy to exist here that wasn't existing because of the force life type he lived. Previous, there was no um, one that lived a pure, communicative it's like, you know, electricity, it goes All right, the line. I understand, yes. And he brought that connector, he was the connector to bring that tap here, and the Holy Spirit is that energy that he brought here that all of us can... The, yes, now look, now look, the question is, do you want that pure energy to flow into your life, yes or no? The answer is I've been living that pure energy for years. You have been living in it? Definitely. Uh, yes. Do you have any anger in you? Mr. Howard... I would like to share the experiences I have with you. Sometimes. Do you have any anger in you? No, I'm, I'm very satisfied. Pardon? I'm very satisfied. No, my question was, do you have anger in you? No, I don't. You have no anger, whatever? Not, not at all. I, I take a lot. Do girls yeah. bother you when you look at a pretty girl? Bother me? Mm-hmm. Oh, why should it bother me? Are you bothered right now? No, oh, I feel very nice. Are you calm right now? Calm. Oh. Okay. It's a good place to come from, I'm, and like yourself, I... I Visibly amongst the, the people in the way that I am promote the truth and that's all I'm about and uh, it was just good hearing I just wonder if you see truth in other religious approaches or if you're creating more dichotomies by saying one is right and the others well, are wrong I never say that well that's what I'm asking no I don't ever say that I say they're all coming from the same place it's just different interpretations and depending on the person's upbringing, as far as I can tell, mm -hmm. is what they will attach themselves to for whatever amount of need till they get to a point where they feel that I don't have enough here now, and then they search more. Because the truth is continually unfolds itself. You live within it, and it's need of you to be it, and be where it wants you to be. May I ask you a question? Yeah. Do you think that right now, while you were talking, you were trying to convince yourself of anything? No. No? No, I'm not. I'm right. just talking. Thoughts come in that, you know, it's spontaneous to everything that's happened. But you weren't trying to convince yourself that your position was right? No, heck no. This I'll see, I'll admit, I'll cop to that, Vernon. I'll admit that, that I do that all the time, and I do this for a living. Right. Well, and everything, right. virtually everything I say, I'm, uh, right. at the same time, I'm trying to reinforce a belief system of my own. Correct. Yeah. Mike, thanks for your call. Hey, have fun. So long. Four minutes before nine, KLOS. Good morning. You're on the air with Michael Benner and Vernon Howard. Hi, my name is June. I'm from Monterey Park. Morning. Hi. I just have a, a question for Mr. Howard. Please. Um, sir, if there are no egos, how do you relate to another person? And as far as love and marriage. Who said there was no evils? This evil runs the world. But do you know what evil is? I think she said ego. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. So was that what you said, June? Yes, I'm sorry. I said egos. No, egos. E egos. There are egos. Would you state your question over again, please? Okay. If there are no egos, right? No. There are an assumption of egos based on lack of development of the whole human mind and spirit. People have delusions because their minds and spirit has not been developed to the part where they see that they are delusions. They believe in themselves, for example, but there is no self to believe in, and this is what drives them crazy. Do you understand that? 
Okay, I can understand. You, uh, you think over what I just said, that uh, ego is a delusion, but it's created by an undeveloped part of man. And when he develops, then he sees he has no ego and has no need for one, then he's free of all the torment connected or with egotism. Or, or feelings, right? Feel, yes, yeah, sure. All, your, all those emotions that now haunt you will be gone, believe me. Ego leads to us and them. Without ego, we have just us. Okay, well... So we still have relationships. And you really want to stop worry. Now, there's even hope for you if your worry has come, has been so hardened in you that it's the only thing you know what to do. There's even hope for you there because we will tell you why you prefer worry to being 100% free of it. Now, your worry isn't going to cooperate with you and getting out of your life. You have to do something outside of the worry and we will show you what that is. So, if you have any questions, even if you haven't read the books, perhaps you'd like to ask something about your personal life, something that's bothering you, anything, whatever, now's the time to do it. Please raise your hands when you ask the question and please keep it short, don't make a speech, come right to the point please and we could, all of us, can accomplish a lot tonight and that's why we're here to go out of here with something we didn't have before something that can live your life for you in a new way all right the lady here had her hand up why do we prefer to be confused you prefer to be confused because if you can understand this try to understand it confusion is a refuge a false one a person says I'm so confused about life, I don't know whether to go left or right, I, I don't know what to do. You know what he's really saying, or she is really saying? Ah, I don't have to do any work. I don't have to make any effort to get myself out of the confusion, I can just stay where I am. People are incredibly lazy. You know what a groove is, a deep groove in the ground? You get stuck in that and running along that groove. And someone says, get out of there, get out of that ditch and start walking on the flat, hard ground. Man been running in the ditch all his life. He says, I don't want to make the effort to get out. Now, if you don't believe this, you watch how difficult it is for you to change the smallest little thing inside you. How deeply the habit pattern is, what a powerful force it is. We will show you how to break that force entirely so that you no longer love worry, so that you're no longer fond of it, and so that confusion, instead of becoming an unconscious refuge, becomes the, the thing you want most of all to get outside of your, get out of your life, because you know that confusion, listen, listen, confusion is pain, right? Well, when you're worried, jumping back and forth, not knowing which way to go, aren't you in pain? Let me emphasize something at the very start, then we'll go on to more questions. You can make it out, that is, you can be free of yourself, providing you honestly face the fact that you are in love with your present wrong, self-punishing life as it now unfolds. You are in love, in short, with your worry and your confusion because there is a way out of it. If you have not found that way, it's because you have not preferred to find it. Here we come into that laziness factor again and where you're afraid. You're afraid if you get out of that miserable little ditch that there's going to be all kind of terrors on either side of it if you get out on the flat ground. Why don't you find out what's outside of it? When I describe the average person's life as a deep, miserable ditch which they run along in darkness and stumble, you know very well I've described human life perfectly. Both the leaders and the followers, both the religious and the non-religious, both the educated and the uneducated. Human beings are all alike in one respect, which is that they are lost. And if you get mad any time tonight at what you have heard, you yourself are the perfect evidence that you are lost. Because anger is a hellish punishment, and you know it. Are you in love with that? You know, in this class, we emphasize negative emotions a lot because we have to study them. Don't talk about love. You don't know what it is. 
Take two, two of the primary emotions which dominate human life, hatred and anger, and you can obviously see how they're close together. Now, just as I'm talking, I want you to turn your attention back and think a little bit. How much anger do you have in you? How much hatred? To that degree, you are a lost human being. We will show you how to toss out that junk which has been torturing you and live freely. Next question, please. The gentleman here. In the past, you have told us to stop being the center of our lives. Now, how can, a, how can an egotist take that as instruction? So it gets on the tape, too. Uh, the question was, in the past, we've been told that we are, that our, we are self-centered. And the question is, how do we, an egotist, become free of being self-centered? I answered the question, if you can make the connection between the previous question and, and yours. You answer this question to yourself. Why do I persist every day, no, every hour, no, every minute, in forms of behavior that wear me down, wear me out and, and push me down. Why do I indulge in that all day long? You will see that you think that it is necessary to be heavily egotistical, that it is necessary for you to continue to live the way you have. And again, you heard the answer a couple minutes ago. It is very frightening to a person who has been lost out in the wilderness. It's very frightening when he is told, now you don't have to live out there in that dry desert. Come here, sir, madam, we will show you how to come out of that wilderness. We will show you how to come home to the beautiful meadow with the pretty streams. We will show you how to do that. Now, wouldn't you think that a human being with an ounce of intelligence would say, Thank heaven you came along and told me I don't have to worry anymore. Wouldn't you think he'd say, thank heaven you came along and told me I don't have to torment myself with jealousy anymore? Quite the opposite. The average individual, you tell him the truth and he gets mad at you. He says, who says, who are you to tell me that there's another life the way I'm living now? I am already living a truthful life. This is very characteristic of religious hypocrites. People who talk about love and how blessed they are from heaven. They quote the sacred books and all that, quote all the time. And the very fact that they have to convince themselves that they're saved proves that they're not. And you, but you, not just religious people, anyone at all, not just religious hypocrites, you tell them, look, you, you have your own false religion. Your religion may be money-making. Your other religion may, and someone else, it may be sex. Another one else might be ambition. Another one might be to live in daydreams when you live in fairy castles up in your mind. I don't know what the population of Westminster is. Maybe 30, 40, 50,000, something like that, right? Let, let's say, let's pull a figure out. Let's say it's 40,000 people in Westminster. An awful lot of people in this town were told all about these talks here tonight, about truthful talks. 40,000 people, just in here alone, say nothing, Garden Grove and the other cities around, 40,000 people could have been here. We have over 200, maybe 250 or something like that. Where are the rest? I'll tell you where they are. They're watching ball games and they're down at the bar and they're sharpening their rifles and they're fixing up their fishing equipment and they're staying home feeling sorry for themselves. Now, I emphasize this for this point. Each one of you individually, and I'm talking to you individually, not as an audience, you yourself are going to see how you don't want change. That's the last thing you want. You'll fight and you'll scream. Don't you know that you look around and you'll see a few people in this room, the ladies at the work table and some of these gentlemen, you'll see that these people were once out where you were. And do you know how they came to the point where they have dedicated their lives to truth as best they understand what that means? I'll tell you how it happened. They came to a meeting just like this some years ago. And they howled and they screamed and they argued and they fought. But they said, please don't listen to me. Take, put a rope around me and don't let me get away. Pull me in. <laughs> That's exactly what they did, because I am, and you listen to me, because I'm too idiotic 
to do it voluntarily. But I sense the rightness of what you're saying. And all of you in this room, in just the few minutes that we have been on here, you have sensed the rightness. Now, you are at the point of decision where you're going to have to say the same thing if you want out of the mess that your life is in. And you know it's wretched. You wonder how you got involved with all these things you got in, mixed up with, don't you? How did I get mixed up with those people, with that situation, and how can I get out of it? We'll tell you how to get out of it. But you have to be here to hear. How are you going to learn how to get out of it if you go back and don't come back to the classes? Anyway, kicking and screaming and hollering, we hauled them in. And you know what? The time came when they got close enough to, her, to the truth, to what you're hearing right now, to what you're hearing right now. They themselves took the rope off of themselves and they dropped it and they said, it's no longer necessary. I understand why you had to tell me all these things, why you had to speak very forcefully and very strongly to me, make certain rules, because I was a little lost sheep about ready to go over the cliff. Thank you for putting that rope around me so I didn't go over the cliff, and you had better do the same thing, or I'm telling you, you're going to go over the cliff, and you're already heading that way. Whether you know it or not, you're heading that way. And if you're mad at what I'm telling you, you're not heading that way, you're rushing that way. And you're going to destroy yourself in one way or another. You may commit mental suicide or whatever. You may go to alcohol. How nice, ladies and gentlemen, that you can find an answer to every single problem that you have inside of you, and you're hearing it tonight. Next question, please. Uh, the lady there. When I see something beautiful or act from my heart, I fall into tears. Fall into tears? I better repeat that. The lady one. said, when I see something beautiful or act from my heart, I fall into tears. All right. The only beauty is truth itself. And when you see beauty, you don't have tears. Now, you can go into your dramatics and you can go into your acting and into your tears with something that centers around you. The question came up about self-centeredness. You can go into your tears anytime you want. And you can have your tears, but you won't have life-saving reality. You won't have what will set you free. You had also better begin tonight, just start tonight, to see where you're wasting all your energies and your whole life and faults in the false use of emotions. Your emotions are your traitors. They've betrayed you all your life. Sentimentality, we already talked about anger and envy. Possessiveness, being afraid of people. How would you like to, to never be afraid of any other human being you contact for the rest of your life? How would you like that? You know how it is now. You meet anyone, you meet a stranger, you meet a stranger and you walk on a little bit to one side because you're afraid of them. How would you like to be free of all that? It is not attained through emotions. It is attained through truth, which is very pure. Then, then you will know what higher emotions are. And you will, you know, now one characteristic of a higher emotion is say, saying, how can I go faster up the mountainside to reach the top? How can I go faster? And you'll look around for ways and you'll find them every time. You know, you're, you're, the beauty of it is that you're walking away from yourself. Who do you think your problem is? Not that wife, not that husband, not the fact you only make half the money your neighbor is making, not the fact that you're growing older and you're aware of it. The only problem is the way you see life and you're seeing life through your accumulated nonsense that your parents gave you and everyone else that the propagandists gave you. We're going to set you free of all that so you can... Listen, you, you know what the word fresh means? Isn't that a nice word? You know, a fresh start. Something new. Something original. I don't care what your age is here, whether you're 20 or 105. You can get a fresh start in life starting tonight. You can have it if you want it. If you don't want it, you won't even hear what I'm talking about, but you'll distort it according to your false self-protection. And you'll go out of here in a daze. And that daze is deliberately self-chosen so that you won't have to face the fact that you are not who you think you are. You think you are a person who has suffered. Oh, I've suffered so much. Look at the drama. Drop the nonsense. 
You're someone who's going to succeed, and your wife is going to be proud of you. How stupid to spend your life trying to make a woman proud of you. She's not anyway. She's just identified with you, and she'd be very glad to get all the money that you're going to make. <laughs> and, sir, you ought to be ashamed of yourself for what you are doing to that woman that you say you care for. You have led her astray because you have first led yourself astray. If you, if you, you men, you wretched men, if you really want a woman to love you, I mean really love you, you become a true man and she will love you and she'll never love you for any other reason, whatever, none. There is no reason in this world for a woman to love a man except that he's a true, decent, wide awake, truly spiritual man. Now, gentlemen, go to work on that. Uh, the chest, please. In one of your books, you said, uh, what the devil fears the most are the few people who want to wake up. Yes. Uh, it was it stated that in one of Mr. Howard's books, he wrote that what the devil fears the most is the one or two people who want to wake up. The devil, we better explain that a little bit. The devil is... Anything that is wrong, anything that's wrong. Now, you think of something wrong, and that's the devil. It's also anything that is unconscious, anything that's unseen in you. Have you ever known a human being who's a devil, who went around acting like an angel, saying nice things, but you knew he was a devil, because he's doing it for personal reasons, for the personal profit, for example? The devil fears to lose any human being whom he has in his power because that is who he feeds off of. That is who he lives off of. You want something kind of shock? How much can you take? Well, let's find out. The devil being darkness, unconsciousness, evil, anything apart from God, truth, reality, that's what the devil is. The devil has to feed off of his own kind. He has to take energy. And do you know, don't you know that the whole world is filled with four billion people, four billion evil devils who are feeding off of each other in wars and uh, narcotics traffic and in crime and in hurting each other? Here's just a very a simple example, and you'll understand this perfectly. Have you ever hurt another person's feeling and felt glad about it? Of course you have. You made that snappy remark and made the woman cry or made the other man mad. Did you, did you notice the feeling of self that you had at that moment, the feeling of power, which was, which was really a feeling of cowardice rather than power? But this was energy which the two of you were exchanging, false energy, the energy of, of negative states, for example. Do you know what the devil, I'll tell you what the devil fears. He fears this meeting here tonight, and every meeting that we have, and he's, he's going to talk to a lot of you people, and he's going to lie to you when you go out of there. And if, you, and if you have any intelligence, you watch and see what you think when you go out of this hall here tonight. And if you see yourself sneering, you have committed blasphemy against God, and I wouldn't be in your shoes for $10 billion for the whole world. You commit blasphemy against what you have heard here tonight. You are a devil. Every one of you in this room, un, un, beneath the surface, we'll put it that way, beneath the surface understood what I just said. And I know you did. And every, every, every single one of you in this room knows that you've heard something you've never ever heard before in your life, most of you. Never heard the truth that saved you before in your life. And you know that it's true. But that's not enough. You don't, know, you don't know how powerful the forces are that want to keep you in a state of sleep. And they'll go out of here, you'll go out of here, and if you listen to them, you'll just go back to the way you were. What do you think these meetings are all about? They're all about showing you where you are out in the desert so that you will have the urge to get out of the desert and climb up into the beautiful green mountain. We'll show you how to do it, or rather truth will show you how to do it. But the choice is yours. Now you listen to this. If you make the choice against yourself, against eternal life, 
If you make your choice against it, you will never, never, never know what you could have had. A man's out in the desert, and he's invited. You, sir, you can climb the mountain where it's beautiful and the air is pure. You can do that. And the man says, oh, that sounds okay. Yeah, I sure like to climb the mountain. Sure sounds nice. This desert is dry and miserable. I'll, I'll climb the mountain. But he's lying. He's just saying that to please the man. So he stays in the desert, and he lives and expires in the desert. Did he ever know what he could have had? All he ever knew was himself, all his own desert self. You'll never know what you missed unless you go all the way with this. There are people who have gone all the way who are on top of the mountain, and they can tell you what it's like, but you have to make the journey yourself. And when you get up on that mountain, now I've said this before, and you'll listen to this, when you, when you finally make it even a short ways up the mountain, you don't arrive on top all at once, in a short ways up the mountain, you'll turn around and you'll look back at that dry desert and you'll say, thank God I never walked out of that meeting and went back and said, I know more than that man. Didn't go into your usual, usual egotistical sneering responses. Thank God I, I began to listen to something other than my own sickness. Thank God for that. That's what you'll do. And when you do that, you'll want to run up that mountain because simply because you, it feels right, you know it's right. It has nothing to do with a psychopathic social world that you live in. It's something totally different. And you will know it's different because it will be inside you. Your evidence is your own new nature. Perfect evidence. Beautiful evidence. Anyone, please. Uh, let's see. Let's take this lady here. Uh, why are we so easily distracted? And is that the same as identification? You're easily distracted because you are still playing with toys. When you're a little child, it's legitimate to play on the floor with all the little games and toys that you have there. You're supposed to outgrow them and grow to love books and things that are better for you as you grow up. Most human beings never mature spiritually. They want the little toys of the endless football games and the endless gossip and the endless idle talk and the endless stupid activities, spending three hours to prepare a meal that's gonna be consumed in a half hour. You, you fill in the blanks. You know what they are in your life. Distract is to break down. Now look, you know what to do, what is, which is to go into despair, to go into anguish, go into hatred, to go into bitterness and hardness. You know, your man left you. You're bitter in your heart after all you did for him. Everything you did for him was for yourself, so forget it. And you, you get all this hardness in you. This is your answer. This is your idea of what to do. What to do is to take it, take advantage of it, to give yourself an ego reinforcement, an ego feeding, and say, ha, at least something very strong and dramatic and painful and horrible is happening to me. Therefore, I have proven that I exist as an independent human being. That is the most horrible lie any human being has ever told himself. And you had better listen to what I'm telling you so that you can start breaking it. You are not going to get out unless you do break it. You will get out if you do break it. We'll take one more, then we'll go home. If there is one. The lady here. Earlier, Vernon, you said there are a few men who have known the truth or, or lived the truth. Just how rare is that? One in a billion. Very, very few human beings ever attain a higher level. But they exist, and they are passing it on. If it wasn't for that, the world, the neighbors would kill each other. And by the way, have you noticed how the world is degenerating? Now look, listen to this. It is, the more degenerate it gets, the more spiritual you can get. So its degeneration has nothing whatever to do with you. It can't touch you at all. It can't touch you. Are you telling me that God can't control you in this world? 
He can take care of you in this world if you belong to him. If you belong to the world, forget it. You're going to go down with it. When you are free, that means to be free of everything that is wrong in you and outside of you. Good night.